Welcome to the channel Learn with Danish. Subscribe and hit the bell icon. Hello all, welcome to the fourth video on structuralism. As I had told earlier in the previous video, it's quite a bit of lengthy video as such. So I thought of breaking up Claude Levi Strauss into two parts. So this is the final part of Claude Levi Strauss, that is the second part of Claude Levi Strauss and the fourth video concerning structuralism. With this we end structuralism and uh, we gradually would be moving on to post-structuralist analysis of uh, critics like Roland Barthes in the next video. So let us just get into Oedipus myth as such. So in the previous video, we have learned that uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss actually expands uh, the insights of Saussurean theory into the mythical narratives. And uh, the example of uh, the myth that he uses is Oedipus myth. And it is used in his essay, The Structural Study of Myth. In order to explore the uh, structural analysis of the myth by Claude Lévi-Strauss, we need to begin with the telling of the myth. Now, you might be familiar with the Oedipus myth, but still, I think in order to move my lecture forward, I need to narrate my interpretation or my narration of the Oedipus myth. So, if you know, please do bear with me for some few minutes. I'll just... Uh, start off with the Oedipus myth. So my version would be acting as a kind of parole but uh, among the different uh, narrations that you might have heard. So the point here that you need to note is that we are not just focusing, this is not significant of analyzing paroles, it is not the individual narration that we are focusing on but rather the deep-rootedness or the lang that we need to focus on related to the mythical structure. Let us start the myth. The myth actually starts off with a person called Cadmus and his sister Europa was abducted by the Greek god Zeus who is called the king of gods. The father of Cadmus actually instructs his sons, uh, that is Cadmus and his other siblings, to go in search of Europa. So all the brothers were scattered in different parts of the world and uh, none of them, even including Cadmus, could find Europa. And incidentally, Cadmus, uh, during his search for Europa, reaches a place called Delphi. Now, Delphi is a place that's famous for oracles in Greek myth. He was told by the oracle that his search for Europa was actually going to be in vain or futile, but instead asked him to find a new city that would be of prime importance as such. So we see that uh, Cadmus, uh, heeding to this advice, uh, sent some, so, some of his soldiers to find the holy water. The holy water was meant to sacrifice a cow for uh, goddess Athena in order to start the new city. The men, however, went in search of the holy water, but unfortunately they were killed by a dragon. Now, after some days, uh, when uh, Cadmus came to know that this man, his men were not returning, he actually goes in search of these men and ultimately encounters the dragon himself. He kills the dragon and uh, takes out his teeth and buries it in the ground. It was goddess Athena who actually told Cadmus uh, to take out the teeth and uh, bury it in the ground. And as a consequence of planting uh, this dragon's teeth in the ground or sowing this in the ground, a number of warriors uh, came out from the ground uh, who were actually called Spartoys. And uh, they were huge in numbers and they started fighting with each other. They were bloodshed all around and ultimately only five Spartoys were actually left out. And uh, when uh, these five Spartoys were left out, they actually proved their allegiance to Cadmus. And uh, Cadmus, with the help of these five Spartoys, actually found the city of Thebes. So this is actually the first part of the Oedipus myth. 
and the myth is followed because it was in the family of Cadmus that our hero Oedipus is born. Oedipus' grandfather whose name was Labdacus was one of the grandson of Cadmus uh, and the name Labdacus signifies lame L A M E one who has uh, difficulty in uh, walking. Labdacus' son was uh, named Laios that was the father of Oedipus and the word Laios signified left-sided Now as we will see in the structuralist analysis of Claude Lévi-Strauss these meanings of these proper names would be really significant. Now Laios actually marries a woman called Yakusta. And uh, in due course Laios becomes the king of Thebes and Yakusta the queen of Thebes. Now King Laios was actually warned by an oracle that his own son would kill him and in order to escape that oracle when a son was born to Laios he actually summons him to a shepherd to kill the baby after pinning his feet by exposing to the elements outside the city that is by exposing him to the sun and the rain and ultimately killing that baby but the shepherd on the other hand was not in a position to do that act instead he actually gives this baby who is pinned at his feet uh, to a neighboring prince and it was this person who actually names uh, Oedipus Oedipus and the name Oedipus actually meant swollen feet now when Oedipus was a young man he learned from the oracle of Delphi that he would kill his father and marry his mother Oedipus didn't know that uh, the father with whom he was living was actually not his father it was his adopted father and uh, he actually runs away from them in order to make that oracle not happen he in fact runs to thebes and during his journey to thebes he arrives at a cross junction and in that cross junction he ran into a chariot that was driven by laios himself and he didn't know that it was laios and it was his biological father but unfortunately there was a quarrel between the two and ultimately Oedipus kills Laius proving the first part of the oracle of Delphi to be true after killing Laius Oedipus arrives at Thebes and when he arrives at Thebes he sees that the sphinx was actually killing people in Thebes by asking riddles and uh, when they failed to answer the riddles the sphinx would uh, kill them and uh, then it was edipus turn he actually answers the riddle of the sphinx and uh, the sphinx is killed by edipus and uh, ultimately he becomes uh, what is known as the savior of thebes and as he becomes the savior of thebes the people of thebes actually crown him as the king because the king is not there and uh, he ultimately marries the queen of that nation Uh, which in fact was his biological mother Yocasta even though he didn't learn that uh, he actually killed his father and married his mother at the first time later on it was uh, revealed to him that he had committed this particular sin and uh, this led him to expel uh, the city uh, of Thebes as such then we have Oedipus's two sons actually ruling over Thebes Eteocles and Polynices but unfortunately we have a trouble between these two brothers and uh, Polynices is killed by Eteocles during a clash and Eteocles also warned the people of Thebes that uh, if anybody gives a proper burial for Polynices he or she would be doomed or would be killed on the spot There was a sister for these two brothers who was called Antigone and Antigone all the time laments and ultimately commits this particular act of burying Polynices and uh, attempts suicide in order to escape uh, the fate that was destined for her with regard to burying Polynices 
so this is actually the myth of oedipus now the way in which uh, claude levi strauss analyzes this uh, mythical narrative or parole is to first uh, segregate it into uh, the level of what he calls myth themes now what are myth themes actually myth themes are actually uh, constituent parts of a myth when you analyze the language we have constituent parts that is just like words so words when arranged together makes up the concept of language so myth themes when arranged in a particular pattern uh, creates the myth so claude levi strauss actually takes or segregates this myth into myth themes and you can see this unique pattern of arrangement by claude levi strauss into four columns that i have projected on the screen now let us try and understand this particular structure in the slide first of all all the units uh, that are listed in this chart are actually uh, individual myth themes inside the oedipus myth for example cadmus seeking his uh, sister europa is one myth theme uh, eteocles killing polynices is another myth theme right so these are all myth themes inside the oedipus myth now levi strauss says that if you read the myth themes that is on the screen in a horizontal manner by disregarding the divisions in the columns you will get the parole of the myth or, or the narration of the myth that i have just narrated to you a few minutes back so you can just read it for yourself uh, starting with the first column the first thing that is written over there and ending in antigone's committing suicide so when you read it in the horizontal manner you get a kind of narration of the entire myth however in order to understand uh, the structuring of this myth you 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 would need to analyze the Uh, the myth themes in the vertical perspective that is taking each column one by one so when you read the myth themes in the first two columns we see that the first two columns are in a kind of oppositional relationship to each other you can say that uh, the first column indicates a kind of overrating of a human relationship that is you there is an excessive rating of human relationship as such for example uh, europa is being sought by uh, cadmus and uh, you have uh, uh, oedipus marrying yocasta and you have antigone burying his brother paul nisus saving his life in the proper manner these are all myth themes concentrating on an excessiveness of uh, human relationships the second column is basically an underrating of human relationship underrating of human relationship is that when you don't uh, specify the importance of human relationship for example spartoi killing one another eteocles killing his brother uh, oedipus killing his father are all written in the second column so overrating of human relationship versus underrating of human relationships that is the first two column when you take the example of the third and the fourth also the third and the fourth also indicate a kind of oppositional relationship but that is quite complex i'll explain that complexity in detail this is the uh, typical way in which a structuralist critic would be engaging or analyzing a uh, narrative first he would be breaking it into fragments or constituent parts and then he would be arranging into a cert- certain particular pattern structure and uh, then he would be applying the theories of structuralism into it now when we look at column 3 it refers to two monsters the one is dragon the second one is sphinx and according to levi strauss they are uh, theonic creatures theonic creatures are creatures that exist out of the earth c h t o n i c so column 3 actually 
stresses the denial of theonic existence according to Claude Levi Strauss now coming to column 4 in the column 4 we have the proper names lambda cos laios and edipus and their meanings to it all of the characters mentioned there have defective feet uh, defective feet or have some problem in walking so this according to claude levi strauss is a typical characteristic feature that is associated with theonic existence as such so column 3 on one hand talks about killing of the dragon and killing of the sphinx that is equal to the denial of theonic existence whereas column 4 indicate or uphold the theonic existence which is the binary opposition of column 3 now we have in front of us two sets of binary oppositional relationship the first set is the overrating of human relationship versus the underrating of human relationship and the second set is the denial of thonic existence versus the upholding thonic existence it would look uh, something like this that you see on the slide over here now this uh, actually divide uh, this mythical narrative into a neat set of structural opposition but this particular underlying mythical structure does not initiate or does not create a tool for enabling us to understand uh, the existence of human being in this world so that is where claude levi strauss goes into the detail as such to connect this uh, structural opposition underlying this oedipal myth uh, with a larger socio cultural content Levi Strauss argues that uh, the underlying language this underlying language of this Oedipus myth actually provide a tool to the primitive human being through which he articulates uh, the conflicting nature of his origin so in short the time when uh, this play was written that is uh, during the time of Sophocles we have two kinds of notion with regard to the origin of human existence what are the two kinds of notion that they had the first notion was that uh, human beings were autochthonous now what is autochthonous it means that uh, they were originally sprung out of the earth there was no kind of uh, the male and female union as such the second notion was that human beings originated with sexual union between male and female that is the cotodian existence that was validated later on as such so here these two notions were conflicting in the society that produced this myth according to claude levi strauss actually the deep structure of the oedipus myth does not provide a solution Uh, to these two particular conflicts as such but what does it do it it actually does it gives us a language to coherently articulate this opposition and uh, place them side by side for a uh, kind of a better understanding of uh, human existence in the world according to claude levi strauss as i quote the myth has to do with the inability for a culture which holds the belief that mankind is autochthonous to find a satisfactory transition between this theory and a the knowledge that human beings are actually born from the union of man and woman although the problem obviously cannot be solved the oedipus myth provides kind of logical tool which relates the original problem born from one or born from two to the derivative problem that is born from different or born from the same so the first column can be taken as an assertion of uh, the human origin and origin through uh, the notion of sexual union between male and female whereas the underrating of human relationship can be associated with a a uh, denial of the notion of the human origin through sexual union and in column 3 we have the denial of theonic existence it can be translated as 
denial of uh, human origin in the autochthonous manner and uh, the fourth column which actually asserts the existence of theonic creatures can be translated as assertion of uh, human beings autochthonous origin so this is how uh, we can read the two sets of opposition that is there in the slide that is projected you can just read it out you need to just uh, see the equal to sign that i have put in between these two oppositional relationship that is uh, the assertion of uh, uh, the human existence through the female union equals the denial of autochthonous origin and on the other hand uh, the denial of uh, human origin through female uh, and male union equals the assertion of uh, autochthonous existence so for levi strauss this is what the oedipus myth means at a deeper level this is actually the mythic lang that he has found out in the oedipus myth it is this lang that actually guides the oedipus narrative as such whether it is my version or your version or somebody else's version the lang would be the same but the parole would be different so here structuralist analysis of a narrative rather focuses on finding the underlying structuring principle that informs uh, any kind of narrative you can have uh, poetry we can have drama you can have fiction any any kind of narrative as such with this uh, i think uh, we can end uh, the session on claude levi strauss i hope you have understood in great detail what claude levi strauss analysis was like especially dealing with uh, the mythical narrative analysis uh, till then it's me danish signing off uh, have a good day learn with danish